football, that distinctly American game, grew up in a gritty place far from the big cities. A place of smokestacks and cornfields. No place has a superior claim to fathering this most grueling of games than Ohio's Stark County. It is not the grand stage of professional football that birthed the game here, but a simple high school rivalry. The neighboring towns from which they came and for which they committed themselves to four quarters of combat. In the beginning, and even today, it is a thing of purity, less about glory than honor. The towns of Canton and Massillon have vied with each other for generations, begrudgingly exchanging the crown of victor, giving their rivals hell, and swearing each season to avenge the loss. On these fields, the dreams and ambitions of entire communities played out. You can call it football if you like, but it was something more. It conferred upon them all an identity a sense of pride and purpose, a measure of self-esteem. Those on the field were not merely our sons, but our proxies, invested with all that such communities can aspire to. If your father or brother or son donned the uniform of the Canton McKinley Bulldogs or the Massillon Tigers, no one needed to tell you that deep down something very special was taking shape here. Something as magical as it was gritty. Only towns defined by steel and sweat could have produced such legions of stalwart souls, and such an esprit de corps as fueled these young men season after season, generation after generation. Nothing soft would come out of this place. It was, to be sure, a rivalry a contest of wills between two immovable forces, butting heads and shoulders, bouncing off the unforgiving and often frozen turf. Yes, a rivalry that would come to be celebrated far and wide, outsized and destined to be an integral and indispensable link in the life of the sport itself. They hated each other as only two worthy opponents can their enmity fused with a measure of mutual respect that had been earned over decades of combat, advances and retreats that spanned wars, the Great Depression, the scourge of local public corruption, the suspicions and name-calling of race and diverse origins. Canton and Massillon had their city halls and corridors of power, but if you were looking to hear the shared heartbeat of these two towns, well, for that, you would have to go to Fawcett Stadium and Tiger Stadium and yell till your voice failed and your hands were too numb to clap. This is what the game was meant to be. How one Saturday a year, it could lift spirits above all hardship and take whole communities to a place where speed and strength and grace counted for so much, almost as much as soul itself. It is not only a game, but a state of mind, a place where myth and harsh realities collide to produce the ultimate rivalry. For football, this is as close as it gets to holy ground. here in Northeast Ohio were populated by immigrants that came to get into tough industries. They were steel towns. Canton, Maslin, Republic Steel, U.S. Steel. You had factory workers, you know, blue collar guys that you know, were looking for the way to express themselves. They have a lot of uh, hard working people. They worked in factories and they worked in farms. Their way to have that toughness demonstrated, if you will, was manifested by the game of football. You know, it was kind of like a social outlet for the whole community. One time in training camp with the Colts, 
We were sitting down talking about guys who were really great players in the NFL. We could not think of one guy in the NFL who didn't come out of that kind of a background. You got 11 players on offense, 11 players on defense, and if everybody's not doing what they need to do for their specific job, then the game doesn't go. That's how factory manufacturing jobs are. I mean, you have assembly lines and you know your job is to do this repetitively over and over again, but your teammate next to you, they have to do something else. That toughness from the steel mills and the industrial side of things really kind of comes through in how Maslin and McKinley have played football. They have an attitude, an ethic, uh, values that are ingrained in me, I think, to this day, winning mattered. Uh, what's wrong with that? I still think it's pretty good. When we talk about football, you have to mention Stark County in the conversation. We had so many good teams and good programs and great athletes in Stark County. There's this sense that it's important from the time you you know, are able to crawl or walk. Two on two, five on five, 11 on 11. And we never played flag or two hand touch. It was always full go tackle. That's Stark County football right there. You had players over decades uh, who just come through and help build up both the programs. You've had great players from both those schools go on and play at the college level and at the pro level. All these people that went on to have great careers, I think the roots came from the passion for football in this area. Imagine being two communities known for being the origins of modernizing and making popular professional football. And you realize how important they are to the beginnings of this, this love affair we have with football. This rivalry spans three centuries, dating all the way back to 1894. It predates most modern annual sporting events. Kent dominated early on. Masson didn't win a game until 1908, the 15th game of the series. Even though we're talking about a scholastic rivalry, it was born in part out of the professional game in Stark County. These early teams were a blend of amateur and professional players. They played in the fields after the game. They passed the hat. They were mainly amateur teams with a few players, we call them ringers, being paid to play the games. Those early professional games are really where the Maslin-Canton rivalry took hold. Canton really dominated those early games in 1900, 1901, 1902. Maslin started to get a little annoyed with being uh, defeated by Canton. They started to raise funds to go out and buy players and poach them off of other teams and really to create a fully professional Maslin Tigers pro team. In 1903, Maslin turned the tables and started defeating Canton. This led to Canton buy more players, poaching players off other teams. You start to have Canton and Maslin uh, developing these super uh, pro teams and really playing fantastic football. It really set pro football up uh, to what it would become. Look at Canton, look at Maslin. These are how we build dominant pro football teams. Canton really helped themselves by bringing Jim Thorpe aboard. That made it really big time in terms of the excitement, the audience, and the attendance. On the other side of town, Maslin went out and got Newt Rockney. Thorpe got stopped two times in a row behind the line of scrimmage by Rockney. And Jim went up to him and said, hey, Sonny, don't do that. These people came to watch Jim run. So the next time, he told him where he was going to go. And he went right through <laughs> Newt and on down for a touchdown. And when he came back, a couple guys were helping Newt off. He had blood all over his face and so forth. And Jim went up and said, thanks, son, for letting Jim run. Harry Hazlitt coached both the professional Canton Bulldogs and the high school Bulldogs at the same time. Hal Broda grew up idolizing those pro players. By the time he got to high school, both teams were sharing a practice field under Hazlitt. The professional players, some of these guys were Hall of Famers, would stay and teach these high school kids some of the finer points of football. This is a very colorful time for pro football and somewhat unstable. You've got players jumping from team to team, from week to week. There was one man that wanted to bring calm to the chaos. He 
There's a Canton entrepreneur by the name of Ralph Hay, and he bought the Canton Bulldogs in 1918. He was interested in picking up the Bulldogs to help his Hupmobile franchise. With the growing interest in pro football within America, Hay really felt it um, important to structure a league. So they met in Ralph Hay's Hupmobile dealership on September 17th, 1920. There were 15 men they couldn't fit into his office, so they went out in the showroom where there were several cars, and they sat on the fenders and the running boards, punctuated by buckets of beer on the floor and cigar smoke throughout. Over the next decade, these franchises migrated from the Decaturs, the Maslins, and the Cantons of the world. Economics drove it to the bigger cities, and I think that the fervor stayed because people in these areas just love football. Who wouldn't want to play football growing up in Canton, Ohio? It's a special place to grow up and love football. Maslin, it's just it's special, boy. To be a youngster in Maslin, you're either playing football at recess, you're playing football in your backyard. We played in the playgrounds, empty lots. We'd be playing football in the street all day long, from sunup to sundown. If you didn't have a football, you made a football. You know, you'd take an old sweatshirt and you'd ball it up. You know, in my backyard, we didn't have a field goal post, but we had like a telephone pole and a pine tree with a cable that ran across and that was our fuel goal. My father, who was an assistant coach for Kent McKinley, and that's what me and my brother knew growing up, and it was all Kent McKinley, it was all Bulldogs. I remember even helping my dad putting the Bulldogs on the helmets, because he would do the helmet stuff. My dad was a sign painter by trade, and we'd roll up all these paper signs, love those Tigers, you know, City of Champions, and we'd go downtown to the merchants on our bikes with these bags, and we'd go in and they'd buy 20 signs and decorate all the windows. Every little boy that was born in the Maslin City Hospital, the Booster Club put a little rubber football in for each one of the little guys. When Molly was born, they wanted to bring her pom-poms like they would give most of the baby girls. I made them take them back and bring her a football. My earliest memories all have something to do with McKinley. Every young boy wants to play for McKinley. My uncle followed the Bulldogs, moved over to the Lehman Stadium and watched that game, and uh, I was just became a McKinley follower from that point on. <laughs> when I came to Maslin in fifth grade, I remember my dad taking me to my first Maslin game. I remember looking over at him and asking him if this was an NFL game. It was crazy, and I just knew from that point I wanted to be a Tiger. I think I was in junior high, and before the Tigers came through the tunnel, I got a chance to peek up front, and I saw tears coming down Eric Wright's face. It's like they filled up into his chin strap, and I just kept thinking, I gotta get to that point. Maslin was the enemy, and then all of a sudden through our careers, we end up over on the other side of the fence. My dad was an assistant coach over in Maslin after he was done in, at Timken, and then all of a sudden McKinley became the uh, enemy. It's intense. I mean, it's just not schools, it's towns. It's these towns, they hate each other. It's true dislike, disgust, disdain. All I know is you have a bulldog on your helmet, I got a tiger on mine, and I do not like you. I just never had a lot of love for Maslin. I would kick their ass. Didn't like them, did you? No, still don't. My wife, Nancy, were married for 55 years. She went to Maslin, and she hasn't converted yet, but it's only been 55 years. Give me another 10. Three years on this on the Maslin team, we never lost to McKinley. And I tell the people that all the time, we y'all never beat us. Anyone from Maslin has anything to say to me, I say I was four and out. I went over to Canton and four when the captains had to go over there, all the girls told me, you got a girlfriend, you got a girlfriend? I said, no, I don't date Canton girls. I didn't really want to go even go in Maslin. <laughs> Stu didn't go past Kmart. He found everything he needed in Maslin, Ohio. He wasn't doing too much coming through Canton unless he had to come play him. There's this circular argument that's been going on for the past 35 years now regarding championships. Number of state championships is 24. The total number of national championships is nine. McKinley has won 12 state championships and two national championships. All they have to do is see non-mythical state titles and you just about have a fight on your hands. 
My mom um, took me, it was in Maslin, and we were sitting right outside the, um, the stadium. And uh, all I heard was T-I-G-E-R-S. And I'm like, what is that about, Mom? She was like, don't you ever chant that in your life. When I was growing up, I used to like the Maslin logo. That's the enemy, you know, you were a bulldog. Canton was the enemy. Uh, they uh, were clearly that in my mind, and yet there was a respect. And that's the great thing about this rivalry, is there's so much respect between the two um, schools. You know that it's going to be one of the most hard-fought games that you'll play, but you also know at the end of the game, there's going to be mutual respect. I have no but respect for uh, Chris Spielman, Rick Spielman, the passion on the Canton side, and then the passion on the Maslin side. Football is Maslin. Canton is football. The rivalry, it's so big. Regardless of what the records are, that game is always a big game. A team could be 9-0, and and you know they lose that game, and it's a horrible season. That game brings out the best in the players. Might be the guy, the receiver, that's been blocking for 10 straight weeks, and he catches the touchdown play to win the game. It wasn't just the teams competing. It was whole community. showing their tigers is unparalleled anywhere in the world. It's been a part of our family for generations. His father was a McKinley Bulldog graduate, so was he, so my children had to be too. There's people that's never missed a, a, a football game in 50 years. I've been to 70 consecutive McKinley Madison games. My sister was born on November 3rd, 1982. The day she was supposed to come home from the hospital was Saturday, Madison McKinley Day. She was supposed to get out at one. My dad said, you're in the safest place you can be. Stay there, I'll be there after the game. Went to the game. I got my first season ticket when I was eight years old. So I went through a lot of coaches and a lot of kids and I loved them all. It was just a great experience. Every husband would have their wife go down to Lindy and the woman would buy a brand new outfit for the McKinley game. When I first moved to the town I live in in California now, Someone knew that I love football and said, oh, do you want to go to the local high school football game? And I said, oh, great, that'd be awesome. I'd love to do that. So I went to the game. I kept waiting for people to get there. I looked, looked at the stands. I thought, my junior high has more people at football games than this high school. Maslin holding, you know, 19, 20,000, and Cam McKinley holding 25,000 people. It was a sold-out game every year. As long as I can remember, it's, you know, been a big deal. I saw how important it was to people who didn't have anything to do with it. Uh, no children playing, had never played, didn't know anybody's kids that played, but just embraced it. You're like a celebrity when you play for Cam McKinley Bulldogs in high school. People know me and I don't even know them. It's like, oh, Morgan Williams, hey, running back. How you doing, man? I'm not so sure that some people remember who you lost to in the playoffs as long as you beat Mass. It was just a good lesson as I watched people I knew who had been in that rivalry, um, that the game is an emotional one. What a benefit you have from an emotional standpoint when you're in a place that everyone clearly has that date circled. When it came down to the final game and you're playing against the McKinley Bulldogs, uh, you better put your chin strap on and, and hang on because it's gonna be rough and tumble. I was excited about the possibility of playing in that type of a game. I've been around a lot of football, I and mean, great football. But there was a certain feeling you got. Goosebumps. Still get them every time you play McKinley. By the 1920s, the Pro Tigers had disbanded. The Canton Bulldogs were still winning championships, but the rivalry was solely owned by the two high schools. 1920, that was a state championship. They scored 285 points and gave up zero points to high school opponents. Rip Miller was the captain. He also was the center of the Seven Mules, the famous line of Notre Dame's national championship team. That team also included the four horsemen, Miller, Layden, Crowley, and Stuhl Dreher. Well, Harry was a good quarterback in high school. Somehow he got a scholarship to play at uh, Notre Dame. Rip Miller then became athletic director for many years at the Naval Academy. 
Stoldrayer went on to become head coach at the University of Wisconsin. 1922 was an interesting year. Dave Stewart was our head coach. And Dutch Hill, he was an excellent athlete. When they played against Akron South, he scored eight touchdowns in one game. And the final score was 94 or nothing. McKinley won their second state title of the decade in 1927, led by star halfback Sam Hodnick. Maslin has a long history of hiring coaches that played for the Tigers. Paul Brown left in 1940, and Bud Houghton came next. And then another Maslin guy came in, that was Elwood Kammer. And then in 45, Augie Morningstar was the coach. Ducky Schroeder was an assistant at Maslin for 23 seasons. Ducky was an interesting guy. He was kind of the uh, country bumpkin kind of guy, but boy, when it came down to getting X's and O's and coaching football, he was the best. Bill Edwards is my godfather. He was a boyhood friend of my father's, and Bill was uh, the star athlete. He was a wonderful man, great sense of humor. When trains would run to Columbus to Ohio Stadium for games, Bill would uh, sell hot dogs on the train <laughs> to these drunks. And my father used to demonstrate, I can't quite imitate it right, but he would put Bill's finger in the hot dog and then Bill would pull out his finger, that's the hot dog. <laughs> It had the bun for these drunks. My dad played for him at Western Reserve. He also played for him with the Detroit Lions. And then when uh, Bill Edwards went to Vanderbilt as the head coach in, I think it was 1948, uh, my, my dad went with him, was with Bill there, and also when Bill and uh, my dad were assistants at the University of North Carolina. Uh, and then, of course, Bill uh, went back to his alma mater to Wittenberg, where he had a, a tremendous career there. Uh, and is in the College Football Hall of Fame. Anybody that knows anything about football that follows it has to know about Paul Brown. People in California would say, where are you from? And I'd say, Maslin. And they'd say, Paul Brown. His life really revolved around football and athletics. The biggest reason he went back to Maslin to coach was that he wanted to coach in a place where the community rallied around its athletics. And Maslin did that. He really had a great feeling for football. The junior highs ran the same place as the high school. Everything was organized. He went down to the eighth grade and looked at their birth dates. So he started redshirt and the guys in the eighth grade. The 1933 yearbook, which is the 32 season, Paul Brown's first season, the yearbook featured him on one page. That was it. Football at Maslin had one page. It was amazing to me to look at the yearbooks and see how much more uh, coverage the football team got the more they won games. There was no bigger name in football than Paul Brown. High school football, college football, pro football. He was a very strict disciplinarian. He was a boss. He would chew a guy out and he would walk away and stomp away, be angry, mad. I was a young kid. <laughs> I did what he wanted me to do. His wings spread out throughout the National Football League, throughout the game of football, period. Even though I was very young and didn't really know anything, I just started to you know, be around football, football teams, it's football camp, and we would go to uh, watch the Browns practice. I know my dad spent a lot of time, you know, with Coach Brown, through Coach Edwards, so, you know, indirectly, I, I definitely am a, in part of that lineage uh, somewhere, um, maybe not directly, but, you know, some kind of an offshoot. When he passed, uh, our team had the opportunity to be pallbearers at the funeral and, and, and see all the greats in, in, in the NFL, all the owners and general managers and coaches who came back to honor Paul Brown. I think when all of history is written, it will be hard to keep Paul Brown out of one of the top one or two or three spots in the history of coaches in the game of football. The other Titan in this rivalry is Marion Motley. Marion Motley. I mean, this guy played at Cam McKinley and made it back to the Hall of Fame. Marion Motley was just phenomenal. He averaged 17 yards a carry. I didn't say seven. 17 yards per carry as a senior. You know, he, he kind of paved the way for football in Canton, Ohio. Phenomenal player, a big guy with a lot of speed. He could run, he could catch, he would block. 
The only three games he lost in his entire career were to Coach Brown. Great career, Kent McKinley, and of course, uh, you know, Paul Brown remembered him. My dad had gone to the Great Lakes Naval Training Station in World War II. His job was to get the best football team he could uh, put together. Marion, of course, was a great player at Great Lakes. Marion was about to board a troop train when Brown used his influence to have Motley's orders to deploy to the Pacific Theater reversed. That was a close call and a potential premature end to Motley's career. At the end of the war, uh, Paul Brown was starting up the uh, Cleveland Browns in 1946. There were no African Americans playing professional football at the time. He wanted Motley to play on the 46 team. From 34 until 45, you had basically a lockout of uh, African American players. To Coach Brown's credit, uh, he never cared what race or creed you were. That was true at Maslin. That was true with the Browns. Bill Willis, who he coached at Ohio State, and Marion Motley, who he competed against at uh, McKinley, both African Americans. Motley ended up at the University of Nevada. He followed former McKinley head coach Jimmy Aiken out there. Aiken was really good friends with Paul Brown. So he, he called Aiken up and said, I need Motley, I'm starting to Cleveland Browns. But don't worry about it, I'm gonna send you a guy that's pretty good. So he got Horace Gillum from Maslin High School to go one year to Nevada, I guess for seasoning before he went to the Browns the following year. This is 1946, one year before Jackie Robinson's called up by the Brooklyn Dodgers. So there's one very interested party watching this situation unfold. That's Branch Rickey. He had an interest in the uh, Brooklyn football Dodgers, and he uh, became aware, I guess, of my dad's team and uh, Motley and Willis. He was monitoring how they were reacting. Motley and Willis, as well as Woody Strode and Kenny Washington in Los Angeles, had to endure the same dehumanizing tactics that Jackie Robinson did. The cheap shots, the racial slurs. Really, it was those four football players that helped make Branch Rickey's decision a lot easier. So you have Paul Brown from Maslin and Marion Motley from McKinley, both playing key roles in the significant historical social event in American history. I think both schools should be pretty proud of that. Jimmy Aiken came to McKinley in 1932. My dad started out, and uh, Jimmy Aiken was the coach over in Canton. So their careers coincided. Both these coaches were coaching during the Depression. A lot of kids had dropped out of school. They met on farms. They met anywhere and everywhere. He'd take three or four at a time, work on blocking, tackling. Enrollment increased quite a bit the next year, and it was a tremendous team. Paul had a player who Got hit in the stomach and, uh, you know, he upchucked. And what upchucked was red. All that came up was tomatoes. We need to do something here. This, this young man needs some kind of uh, a support. They formed a booster club to put groceries into people's houses. I was very good friends with the first booster club president, uh, Tink Ulrich. Tink would tell me that they had two jobs. One, to make sure the kids were eating right and they had food, and then secondly, to take the kids home from football practice. That was one of his reasons for starting the Booster Club. The other reason was the drums were beating in the town and the things weren't going real well for Paul Brown at the time. And there was talk that people wanted to get rid of him. So he started the Booster Club just to kind of get the community involved and to try and answer questions when people would ask. And they would meet on Monday nights and Paul Brown would field questions from everybody in the community. It seemed to buy him enough time until he actually started beating McKinley and Jimmy Aiken. My dad respected Jimmy Aiken as a coach. He liked him as a person. They were friends. Aiken and Paul Brown actually took fishing trips together in Canada, but they couldn't let the fans know that they did that. Those coaches had a real rapport with each other. I think Paul Brown really took a lot from Jimmy Aiken. He had such experience. The Ball Carrying Made Easy book by Jimmy Aiken. There are so many things in that book. Everything from how you handle players, uh, how, how you deal with the uh, people that might be today considered booster club members, the diplomacy, the politics that go along with, well, he, it's all in the book. Aiken turned and also ran into a perennial contender. Those enormous profits that the football team began to turn under Aiken were parlayed into Fawcett Stadium. He could certainly be called the godfather of McKinley football. You have these two Renaissance men in Paul Brown and Jimmy Aiken. I think it really raised the rivalry to a new level. Jimmy Aiken 
beat Paul Brown three times. When it came to football, uh, they battled as hard as they could. Well, the 34 game, it was uh, the first time that you started to see the media really get into high school football. 50 different sports writers got credentials. There were three radio stations covering the game. The Goodyear blimp had a banner flying behind it. Both teams were undefeated going into that final game. They were ranked one, two in the country. They had 8,000 stands in their permanent stadium. I think Maslin added 12,000 more seats. It was the first high school game played before a crowd of 20,000. Jimmy Aiken went out to the field before the game and uh, found the field to be slightly soggy. Well, it had been dry for a number of days, so they thought that maybe the fire department somehow found their way there Saturday morning. So that was, that was a, a little bit of gamesmanship that took place right there. McKinley won the game and went on to be named state champions and national champions. In 1934, Masson was not happy with some goings on both on and off the field. And the Masson Board of Education was irked. They wanted to have a meeting with the Canton Board of Education. If the Canton Board of Education didn't meet with them, they were gonna drop the series. The Canton Board of Education balked and there was no meeting. Masson was not happy about this. In fact, their first schedule that came out had the 10th week as an open date. Cooler heads got together on both sides. They decided they needed each other more than uh, they'd like to admit. Paul Brown had lost three years in a row. He'd scored a grand total of six points in three years. They were ready to get rid of him. He had to win that game, and it was a very close game. The guy that was kind of the hero for Mass was a guy named Bob Glass, and they gave it to him, and he scored. And that was the only touchdown scored in that game, and it ended up 6 nothing. So Paul Brown, uh, saved his job for sure. Had he lost that game, who knows? All the state championships that he won at Madison because he ran off a string of about six straight after that. Then he went to Ohio State, two years there, won a national championship in 42. After the war then, he was able to start then the Cleveland Browns and went down and started the Cincinnati Bengals. And you know, maybe all of that wouldn't have happened had uh, Bob Glass not scored that touchdown and Madison win the game six nothing. After 1935, Jimmy Aiken left McKinley to go coach at the University of Akron. There's speculation, and there's an article in the Maslin Independent that said McKinley had actually reached out to Paul Brown and offered him the Canton job. In addition to Akron and Nevada, Aiken also coached at Oregon, where he witnessed the beginning of some pretty impressive careers. Norm Van Brocklin, he was a quarterback at Oregon. Johnny McKay, the, the coach at Southern Cal, was a halfback at Oregon. McKay got his start in coaching under Aiken as an assistant at Oregon. Starting with that tight win in 1935, Maslin ran off a string of seven straight victories over McKinley. They would just win game after game after game, ran off state championships like six in a row, they won four national championships. So it was really a, a heck of a streak. The 38 game was an interesting game because the number of players that later played for Paul Brown, the Cleveland Browns, you had Marion Motley and you had Lynn Houston and Horace Gillum. Marion Motley got injured. A hard tackle by Lynn Houston and Horace Gillum. Legal, fair, but brutal. Amazing that you had that many guys who would eventually play in the NFL, let alone all on the same team, and play for one of the guys who was a coach. Bob Glass was killed on Green Island. He was a Marine, he was a tough guy. Same thing happened with George Slusser. George was like two days from the end of the war and he got shot down and they never found his body, never found his plane. I talked to people that were around when Don Scott played and they say he was simply the greatest. He went to Ohio State where he was captain of their team in All-American and he unfortunately was killed in World War II. Ben Schwarzwalder coached McKinley for one year in 1941. McKinley fans can only imagine what he would have done if he hadn't been called into service for World War II. Blood and guts, tough, tough, tough. He believed in athletic ability, but he believed in workouts. <laughs> Rather than go to your study hall, he put you into a wrestling class. Well, when Ben Schwarzwalder came back from the war, he, he found a coaching job at Muhlenberg, the Muhlenberg Mules. The Mules were not very good when he took over. So what he did is he went back to Stark County and he recruited three players from McKinley. Joe Pugeson, Abe Asselinides, and Jack Kreider. 
In 1946, Muhlenberg actually led the nation in offense, headed by Jack Kreider. These three players, along with Schwartzwater, rebuilt the program, and they led the Mules to their first bowl game, the Tobacco Bowl. Ben knew the kind of football that was played back in the Canton Maslin area, and, and so you know he was going to come back here and recruit. That success at Muhlenberg landed Ben the Syracuse job. He coached there for 25 years, won a national championship in 1959. Ben Schwarzwald coached some pretty good backs. Jim Brown, Ernie Davis, Floyd Little. He didn't forget Stark County. He would go back and recruit there. He brought John Calcerian from McKinley and Charlie Brown from Maslin. Brown went on to play for the Chicago Bears. The 1940 team was probably considered one of the best high school teams, certainly of the era, maybe all time. Paul Brown made the statement that he thought his 1940 Masson team could beat his 1941 Ohio State team. Going into the McKinley game, Masson's two star players were Tommy James and Horace Gillum. Kathy Garrison was an unbelievable back. He scored the first touchdown, which was the first touchdown scored on Masson all year. Not only is this the first time Masson's been scored on all year, they're behind. And then after that, of course, Masson picked it up and won decisively. They were playing for the state championship for sure, and as it turned out, Massimo also won the national championship. In the 1940s, Jim Thorpe would occasionally come back to Canton, either to give speeches or to visit friends. In 1940, he stopped by Canton McKinley and gave the team a pep talk. He was named honorary coach. So in the 1940 game, he had Jim Thorpe on the Canton McKinley sidelines and Paul Brown on the Masson sidelines. Masson and McKinley just started trading back and forth. And if you were Masson and McKinley and you went 10 and 0, you probably were going to get some votes and probably going to be named state champions if you won that game. The 1945 game was played in an absolute quagmire and is known as the Mud Bowl. It ended in a 0 0 tie. In 45, they went 5 0 5. And they were the Tigers, T I E, because they tied five games. Bob Burick was dedicated to McKinley. He played no favorites. He'd smack a, an all state tackle as soon as he'd smack a third string guard. After the 44 game, he told his team, you have the true spirit of McKinley. If you got a compliment from Bob, you'd earned it. In the late 1940s, Maslin started a second seven-game winning streak over McKinley. 48 started a streak of wins and also state championships, national championships. Both schools and the rivalry have received a tremendous amount of media coverage over the years. In 1943, the Saturday Evening Post decided to do a feature on Canton, Dick Kempthorne, and the McKinley program leading up to the Maslin game. I think I was just a lucky guy. He came by and, and they picked me out to, to make the features because you, you get a little notoriety when you get featured. And, you know, you know, but it was really for the entire team. The McKinley people, it is thought, got copies of the paper and dropped it from a plane. Masson won the game 21 0. Masson was infuriated with the Saturday Evening Post and they started writing him letters, calling them. Finally, supposedly in good humor, the Saturday Evening Post said, please stop. Lou Mariano was big, strong, fast. Lou Mariano was a deaf mute. Everybody always wondered, you know, how he got to place and so on and so forth. He was just a tough guy. I mean, when he went to Kent State, he proved it. He's in the Kent Hall of Fame. Chuck Mather was really one of the better coaches that I ever had. I mean, as far as knowledge and teaching and, and coaching. Chuck Mather was more of a technique and strategy kind of a coach. He had a real good uh, offensive mind. Chuck Mather was actually the father of the Green Bay Sweep. He actually devised it at Maslin. He would speak at coaches' clinics, and there were college coaches there who were taking notes. One of those coaches was Vince Lombardi, so what later became the Green Bay Sweep actually was started by Chuck Mather. We really scored a lot of points in those days. We had rough and tumble practices, too. We practiced four or five hours a day. <laughs> he had six really stud teams here. It was 57 and three. 
and he lost three games by a total of, I think, 18 points. So he was very close to being 60 and 0. Chuck so had a great career at Maslin and then was head coach at Kansas. Uh, but then he was on uh, Coach Hallis' staff with the Bears. Chuck was really, I would say, George Hallis' kind of right-hand man there uh, when he was with the Bears, and, and including the 63 championship season for Chicago. Yet another college football Hall of Fame coach to come out of Maslin is Don James. Don James played for Maslin in the late 40s. Went into coaching, and uh, one of his stops was Kent State and then he went on to coach at the University of Washington, where he won a national championship, several Rose Bowls. They have a huge mural of Don James in their Hall of Fame, the guy is their greatest coach ever. And while at Kent State, one of his players was Nick Saban. Now, Nick Saban credits Don James with being his mentor and influencing how he coaches the game of football more than anybody else. I guess the players here are better coached. They're more ready to play major college football. When I went to Michigan State, our guards weren't pulling for her badly. They weren't getting out in front of him. And the coach, Duffy Doherty, told me, I'd show him how to do it. And I did that. And I pulled and I threw a block for Herb downfield. And from then on, I was started as a guard. And that's because of my background at McKinley. When I got down to Ohio State, they said, uh, we're going to do drills. And they mentioned one drill, and everybody looked at each other, and nobody knew how to do it. I can show you, because I learned this at McKinley. Our coaches were always on top of the latest state of the art in football. We knew how to post block. We knew how to do it correctly, more so than the other kids. Now, Coach uh, Hayes would point that out and say, this is how you're supposed to do this. There were high school coaches from the state of Ohio who came to be in the junior high system just to learn the system so they could then go out and do a better job in the high schools. It is a, a true honor to look at the list of McKinley coaches and to see who has been in your shoes. If you go into the team room at Maslin, you know, it starts with Paul Brown. You just go, go down and you just look at all these names and go, oh my God. After you are out, there is a natural bond between McKinley and Maslin coaches. There is a fraternity. We've been in that seat. We kind of we kind of get it. I remember sitting at a bank, and I remember Don Nealon was the speaker. And I remember after the banquet, uh, driving back home to Youngstown, thinking, you know, I could do that. And he kind of gave you that belief. And of course, I was blessed to be an assistant coach for Earl. And, Working for Earl and his talk of the Maslin McKinley rivalry and, and his talk of the Ohio State Michigan rivalry and the way he talked about it all year round, um, I think that's really when it clicked for me just how intense rivalries are and just how good you better be. It attracts a certain type of individual to handle number one, the pressure. Oh, 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 oh pressure. I'm talking to Earl Bruce one morning. I said, Coach, Glenn Mason told me that Maslin was the toughest job you ever had. He goes, it was. Tougher than Ohio State? I thought he was gonna punch me. He goes, what did I just say? It's the toughest job I ever had. Some guy was on the loudspeaker, he had one of those megaphones, and he goes, you call yourself a coach? You can't hide, there's no place. I mean, they, they know who you are. It became apparent to me very early that uh, you better win. The very first time I shook a hand in Canton, Ohio, I was, hey, coach, welcome aboard, beat Maslin. You know in a place like that, if you lose, you're not going to be around long. If you're a coach and you win that game, you're God's greatest gift to earth. But if you lose that game, you're getting for sale signs, put in your front yard, and they're trying to run you up out of town. People have asked me about the pressure you know, to win that game, and uh, I don't know that I ever felt it from an exterior source. It was always internal. I think there's more pressure in the Maslin McKinley game on the coach because that's a game that you have to live with. There's definitely pressure in that game. I mean, probably above and beyond even a state championship game. Fed Vickerall did a lot of the Maslin McKinley games over the years. He said those Maslin McKinley games have more pressure than these Division I state championship games. Even the official could feel it. You're from McKinley, you've got to beat Maslin. And if you're from Maslin, you have to beat McKinley, and that's the bottom line. People everywhere seem to know about the McKinley-Maslin rivalry. It's known around the country. Maslin-McKinley, you know, 
people know. We've heard about McKinley and Madison. You heard it right. <laughs> Chris Spielman was on the Wheaties box. I think every high school football player in the country was aware of Chris Spielman and the rivalry with McKinley. I usually take a Maslin t-shirt and work out in it wherever I am on the road. And so people will come up, is that the Maslin, the, the high school football? And I'll just say, yeah, that's the one. You go on vacation in Florida, if you wear a McKinley jersey, you get stopped 60, 70 times. One time going down to Atlanta to see Cam, I had a Tiger hoodie on. Go Tigers! And my head snapped. Everywhere I went, somebody knew about the rivalry. We played in the first London game, and it was an English accent. Is, are you, is this the Maslin football, that high school football? And he knew about Maslin McKinley. Is it from London? When I was the head coach at Maslin, I'd get on an elevator, and there's Tom Osborne and Lavelle Edwards. They see my badge, and they go, now is that the Maslin McKinley game? Is it really what they say it is? I go, yep. Ozzie Newsom. He was a great tight end for the Cleveland Browns. Somehow we were able to get Ozzy to speak. So he talks to our squad. He said, I just wanted to come to Canton McKinley because I'd always heard about the rivalry growing up in Alabama. In the National Football League, they, they ask about that Mass McKinley rivalry. Is it really that serious? Is it really, really big? And I said, it's everything you can imagine. There's not many people that I've met, especially in the coaching profession, that aren't aware of this. They know what it is, they know how long it's been going, they know what it's about. I had Hall of Famers over the years ask me, what was that really like playing in that McKinley Maslin game? Chuck Mather left the Tigers, he went to Kansas. So in 54, Maslin brought in Tom Harp. 54 game, McKinley was ranked first in the state, Maslin was ranked third. The winner of that game gets the state championship. Masson's star player was Homer Floyd. Now, Homer Floyd was fast. He gained 260-some yards in that game. He later went on to Kansas and had a great career uh, in civil rights. Masson had Jim Houston and Dave Canary, who many of you remember as Candy on Bonanza. After that game, Masson deservedly was rated number one. Wade Watts came in 53. He knew his X's and O's, and he knew players' talents, and he utilized them. Watts had come from East Liverpool, where he coached a kid by the name of Lou Holtz. On his way out of town, he stopped by the Holtz household, and he told his parents that he thought Lou would have a nice career in coaching. Wade was probably way ahead of his time. He believed that football was a game of short sprints. So every day after practice, we would run short sprints. I mean, till you couldn't hardly breathe. Wade Watts used a single wing, and his signal caller, Jim Dreher, had the outstanding blocking back. In the second play of the game, he received a concussion and had to leave the game. Watts didn't want to risk this again. So in 1955, he implemented the wing T offense. And by running that wing T, he just devastated everybody. For two straight years while I was there, we were undefeated. The 55 game was played in a snowstorm with a full crowd. The 1955 game was the first high school game that was televised. It was just a thrill to see it on television. McKinley had Bobby Lee Williams, finest athlete I've ever seen in high school. One of the hidden reasons we won that game was our middle guard, John Ifantides, who just about killed Maslin Center. Ifantides was going with the ball because he wants the guy's veins in his wrist. We had Two bad snaps in that game. On a punt, Maslin Center hikes the ball from about the 40-yard line back to the four-yard line. McKinley recovered the ball, which set up a short touchdown. Matt Barbosa took it in. We won it 13 to seven. Wayne Fonts and Ike Grimsley were quite the ball players. They both scored over 140 points. Phil Martin, who scored over 140 points also, and scored three touchdowns that game. We were totally, totally dominant from the start of the game. We told them where we was gonna run. I'd point down there and I'd say, high diddle diddle like up the middle, or high wackle wackle, lane off tackle. They didn't believe that we would do what I said we was gonna do, and that's what made it so interesting.
Wayne Fonts after high school, and along with Ike Grimsley, went up to Michigan State where he was a starter. He went to the New York Titans, six interceptions, one pick six, had a very good season, then he got hurt. After his playing career, he went down to Dayton where he coached under John McVay. Wayne Fonts uh, was a uh, super coach. We would have that shootout, we were kidding, kidding each other about Mass and McKinley. Uh, when we were coaching at Dayton. Then he went to Southern Cal where he coached under John McKay. This is the same John McKay that got his start in coaching under Jimmy Aiken. He followed uh, McKay down to Tampa Bay. And he went on and was the head coach of the Detroit Lions. Barry Sanders' first day in pads. I'm in my second year with the Lions and Barry runs the ball and I come up and hit Barry. And Wayne used to drive this golf cart around and he would pull up to uh, me and he said, Chris, you and I are boys. We're both from Canton. I love you. I love you like a son. But I got to tell you, if you hit Barry again, you're going to be back on a bus to Canton. Don't touch Barry. Barry Sanders really admired Wayne Fonz. In fact, he mentioned him in his Hall of Fame induction speech. This speech was given in Fawcett Stadium on the exact same ground where Wayne Fonz practiced and learned the game of football 50 years earlier. Russell came to Maslin in 1956, obviously uh, McKinley won. My dad had these sweatshirts made and it had the score. And it was like 34 to seven, or I don't remember the score, but it was not a good score. So he had to come back the next year and the pressure was on him to win. And fortunately for him, they won and this started some streaks. And of course, following him was Leo Strang and the, the streaks through the late 50s into the 60s. In 1957, the Nickel Plate Railroad Company donated a brass bell from a retired locomotive to be the official game trophy. Lee Trestle was the first coach to win the victory bell. He was always going to take it outside of simply the X's and O's. Whichever team wins, runs over and grabs the bell. The other players would go across the field and get the victory bell and bring it back to the winning side. I was the first person to the bell. I just looked at it and I looked to the crowd and I said, it's coming home. I just remember seeing Ellery's chubby ass riding across my stadium as he took it back to his sideline. And that was like the most painful memory of the McKinley National Robbery that I had. Whatever team wins gets to keep the bell. We had the bell for quite a long time. We didn't even know there was a victory bell because we hadn't won in nine years. The victory bell came up missing. It just happened to be during the uh, McKinley Maslin week. McKinley, did they do that? Where's the victory bell? Where's it? So probably the hardest thing for me as Booster Club president was to find some place to hide the bell. The uh, victory bell happened to show up in the locker room the uh, morning of the McKinley Maslin game. And just all the kids, you know, they got all revved up and ringing the bell. Lee Trestle left Maslin and went up to Baldwin Wallace and just really had a great career up there. Trestle recruited four Tigers and three Bulldogs his first year at BW. McKinley's Obie Bender was the MVP of the 1961 undefeated Yellow Jackets team. Dr. Bender had a lengthy career at his alma mater, holding several high-level positions. Leo Strang was obsessed with excellence. Leo was more intense and more prepared and more everything that I'd ever seen before. Leo brought in Nick Verotsis. I was there 33 years. That was my life. That's all I knew. Masson was like 22 and 12 over that period that Nick was the assistant coach. Nick is a classic. He had Steve, he had me. Oh, he called me Steve until I made all the high days. He started calling me Joe. <laughs> Well, Leo was uh, a great coach, and uh, he was an innovator. And he had a flair for the dramatic. He wanted his teams to look good. 1958-59, he's got people running around with white shoes on playing high school football. Billy White Shoes Johnson in the NFL, that was in the early 1970s, was the first one to give out helmet stickers. If you had an outstanding block, or if you graded better than 90%, you would get a star in front of the helmets. He saw the Exxon ad with the Leaping Tiger, and he thought, well, you know, I ought to be able to put that on the side of the helmets. So when he got the Maslin, he put the Leaping Tigers on the side of the helmets. That was the first helmet decal. Some people credit Leo Strang with putting a 
camera in the end zone. Strang inserted a Polaroid camera into a film camera body, attached a zoom lens, and placed it in the scoreboard. Right before the snap, they took a photo. As it developed, they pulled it down to the field where Leo's son Carter would run it over to the coaches as it finished developing. The innovations that have emerged from this rivalry are almost as abundant as the players and coaches that have participated in it. Hal Brodo, first of all, was a starter at McKinley, and he went to Brown University where he was All-American, but his lasting kind of contribution to, to football is shortening the pants so the knee pad doesn't inf influence the movement of the knee. Brody didn't just invent it, he got a patent for it and then signed a contract with the Spalding Company. Bud Shotbell was a standout player from McKinley in the early 1930s. Later, he was a scout and a Big Ten official. Once, when he was officiating a game, he noticed red flags sticking out of steel pipes used to mark the corners of the end zone. It's still amazing nobody put an eye out. So before the 63 Hall of Fame game, Bud invented the modern day pile on, which is still in use everywhere football is played. Paul Brown was an innovator, obviously. The playbook probably started at Maslin. My father was a teacher. He was a history and English teacher. When you went to his class, you were expected to take notes. The playbook was simply an outgrowth of that. He expected his football players to take notes. He was the first to devise the draw play. Graham and Motley uh, collided in the backfield, and the ball popped up in the air. So there was a pause as Motley reached out for the ball. He looked up and saw an opening, and he shot through it. They saw it on film of the game, and they made that into the draw play. He was the first to use messenger guards to send in plays. Lynn, he was the messenger guard when Paul Brown decided that he wanted to send the plays in with the lineman. Coach Nealon. Growing up in Canton, the McKinley Maslin game when I was a little guy, this was like the Super Bowl. Me and my buddies would sneak in and try to see that game once in a while. He was very excitable to play for. He was so pumped up in the locker room at uh, halftime that uh, he hit the fuse box and all the lights went out in the locker room, man. <laughs> I knew he was college material when he was with us. Don Nealon, who come from the coaching ranks of uh, Kent McKinley and goes on to coach at West Virginia, great coach at West Virginia. When Nealon was at Bowling Green, he had good coaches there too, Jack Harbaugh. He's the father of Jim and John Harbaugh. He was a junior high his ed teacher in Canton. And for the Maslin game, they asked him to come up and work with the varsity, prepare for Maslin. He thinks, oh, they're recognizing what a good job I did. He was the scout team quarterback who got the hell beat out of him all week long by these high school kids. And he lived in Maslin. So one day he comes out to go to school, his car's painted orange. The first time I met Coach Bruce, it was at track practice. Uh, he had just been named the Maslin coach. And uh, he said, hey, you guys want to run a little race? He whips off his sport coat. Earl shot out, and uh, he probably beat us by 10 yards in a 40-yard dash. Earl Bruce was the best. You know why he was the best? He never lost. 20 and 0, two state champions. Man, you, you really didn't get to see what Masson was all about. And he'd shake his head and say, I didn't really want to see what Masson was all about. I didn't want to lose a game. I just wanted to win every one of them. You know how I hate to lose. I hate to lose. In 1964 game, both Masson and McKinley were undefeated. This is the, all the marbles. We were playing for the state championship. The lead up to that game was just tremendous. We had around 20,000 people that game. I was a sophomore, and I reached the opening of the uh, locker room. And I looked around, and there was so many people, I started to go back in the locker room. <laughs> Masson was a great high school team. We were a great high school team. McKinley had some great athletes. I got hurt the first offensive play. I separated my shoulder, throwing a block downfield. Literally stayed there on the sidelines that whole game. Actually cried the whole game. I mean, it was, to me, that was a culmination of my career. McKinley jumped out on top. This was their MO all season, the score early and often. The second score was a Pete Collegeras touchdown, which was followed by a Dave Shegog fumble. You fumbled the ball. You feel so bad. You're just hoping that you can 
make up for it. We were ahead 14 to nothing at halftime. Steve Canner, the quarterback, gets injured. They bring in David Chigog. Dave Chigog, who was unbelievably talented. He was the right guy to come into that game. He was so calm and collected that nothing ever bothered him. You get another quarterback in there, sometime it sparks up the team. This guy was in charge. So he came in and got everybody settled down. He did it with running the ball, with the option. And when you score one, then you get fired up more. It might be a chance. They came back and beat us in the, in the fourth quarter. Scored three times. The play that really counted was a punt play. It was a punt, and it took a weird, kind of a high bounce, it went up. You tell guys, run away from the ball. Me, me and y'all were seeing that, oh, I can catch this. <laughs> <laughs> he jumped up really high, picked the ball out, and ran down to the, about the 17-yard line. Shigog ran out off the outside, got hit a couple of times, and broke a couple of tackles, and ended up scoring with less than a minute left in the game. When the, the big game came and the moment came that he had to step on stage, he did. We don't win if Shegog don't go in. Shegog's knee wasn't quite in <laughs> in the end zone. Hey, I tell him, I wasn't the ref. I was just the quarterback. Masson won 20 to 14 and won the state championship. One of the great games in McKinley and Maslin history. This rivalry is set in Ohio. It sent countless players to the Ohio State-Michigan rivalry. Some people don't understand what Maslin Canton is. Some people don't know what Ohio State and Michigan is. It is the same thrill. I think there's a lot of similarities. They both have week-long events leading up to the game. Both of them go back quite a ways. The physicality of both games were very similar. It's the last game of the season. How you feel the rest of the year is determined on that game. To me, as a player, they had the same feel to them. You knew what a robbery was before you ever got um, to Columbus. Just playing in that Massimo McKinley game, it prepares you for the Ohio State. You know, Michigan game. When you're playing McKinley or when you're playing Michigan, it just brings out the best in you. And if it doesn't, you don't belong in the game. You just know when you play McKinley, it's going to go up a notch. You go to Michigan, Ohio State, it's the same thing. It's like Green Bay and Chicago Bears. When I played against the Chicago Bears, it always went up a notch. No one asks you when you come back to Ohio State, what was your bowl record? No one asks you when you come back to Maslin and McKinley, what was your playoff record? What was your record against Maslin and McKinley? When you're at Ohio State, what was your record against Michigan? The Michigan-Ohio uh, State game is, a, is always a highlight, but it doesn't replace the McKinley-Maslin rivalry. Graduating from the Maslin-McKinley rivalry to the Ohio State-Michigan rivalry made friends out of enemies and foes out of friends. Dennis and I grew up together. Him going to uh, Michigan, I can't even say it. <laughs> it just blew me away. The two guys that I played with at uh, Ohio State were uh, Nick Roman and Jim Roman. We played together on a national championship team. The number one turnaround in the future of Ohio State football was the hiring of Paul Brown. He kind of turned the whole mindset of the state. That's the college to go to. McKinley players followed Paul Brown to Ohio State in droves. Jack Duggar was an outstanding player in high school and college. He was All-American at Ohio State, played on Paul Brown's national championship team. Because of World War II, there was a tremendous shortage of football players. The upperclassmen were gone, so some freshmen played. The backfield was the McKinley backfield, actually. It was Matt Brown, Clem Williams, Ernie Parks, and Jasper Harris. Bob Cummings was a guy that got it. He understood football, he understood Maslin. Bob Cummings was uh, probably outside of my dad, probably influenced me as much as anyone. We heard that this new coach was hired. We saw him walk in. And there was this little short guy, bald head, glasses on. My impression was, that's our new coach? He ended up being a fire plug. He was something else. Tough, very disciplined. When we were juniors, he would call out and say, you know, next year we're going to win the championship. And he declared that. Cummings went directly from Maslin to a D1 school, his alma mater, Iowa. Ron Chismar left McKinley after the 1969 season to join Don Neelan's staff at Bowling Green. 
he was replaced by John Bridewieser, who had coached one year as an assistant under Cummings at Maslin. Going from Ron Chismar to John Bridewieser, John Bridewieser was a little bit more strategic. In his first year, Bridewieser had to face the Maslin juggernaut team of 1970. My roommate was Tom Cardinal, who was the captain of that 1970 team, which some people will argue might have been the as good a team as Maslin has ever had. We were 9-0. We were ranked number one in the state. We were 0-1 oh going into the Maslin game, which was a lousy day. Friday morning, it started raining. It didn't stop raining until Saturday morning. We come out for pregame, and the field is nothing but soup. I mean, it's, it's mud and water. Larry Harper runs the opening kickoff back about 94 yards and scores. And he's going all the way! He ran right by me. He could only be two feet. And you know, he just looked at me and saw this smile. And I wanted to attack him. It's a good thing I did. I'd probably been in my last game. Pitches the ball off to Marger. Marger outside. He's trying to get inside and is inside for the score. Well, we go into halftime down two touchdowns. We're probably 10 pounds heavier from the mud and the water. We come back out for the start of the second half. We look downfield, and the Maslin team have on brand new uniforms. I imagine those dry uniforms uh, certainly feel good, too, to get away from the soft, wet things that they've been wearing. Man, this is devastating. Mentally, it just drained us. Maslin finishes 10-0 and wins their 24th state title. In 1973, Canton was going to go from four high schools down to two, eliminating Lincoln and Lehman. Timpkins going to be called Timpkins Senior. McKinley, we don't know yet what it's going to be called. So there was a lot of uh, wringing of hands, both in Canton and Maslin, that there might not be a Canton-McKinley to play Maslin every year in football. Charlie Bowersox really spearheaded a campaign. We started taking petitions around. Keep the name McKinley. My God, it's one of the most famous schools in the country. They finally went to McKinley Senior. There was a column in the Maslin newspaper where they basically said they were very happy that they were keeping the name McKinley. The title of the column was Yay McKinley. And in the article, it said, this is the last time that expression will be used. In the 1970s, Bulldogs like John Grimsley populated some fantastic McKinley teams. They always seemed to be knocking on the door of greatness, only to have it slammed shut by Maslin. We already had some bad luck against Maslin. In 1974, McKinley knew a state title was up for grabs. Going into the Maslin game, they were ranked number one in the state. That was the best team that oh, I've ever had. We were big, you know, underdogs. It's a game I'll never forget. Um, a game we should have won. It's a touchdown to Strader. Masson got ahead early, and Bill Harmon, he kept, just kept feeding him the ball. Hand off again to Harmon. Late in the game, trailing 14 to 6, the Bulldogs get the ball on their own five-yard line. Quarterback, McKinley's quarterback, Rock Hannes, engineers a 95-yard touchdown drive. He was one of the coolest quarterbacks I've ever seen in my life. Every third down conversion we had to make, the ball was right through on the money. Lombardi gets the touchdown! Tigers are expecting anything. Eric Llewellyn recovered the onside kick. It's the Bulldogs ball! Late in the game, we finally went ahead. Honest kick from the 15-yard line, hit the upright. The Bulldogs go on top, 15 to 14. After the ensuing kickoff, Maslin starts methodically driving the ball down the field. I'm familiar with the drive besides the Cleveland drive. We come down throwing out with one. Two outs, three outs. So there are exactly 13 seconds showing on that scoreboard clock. Would up on the center, going to his right. All kinds of pressure. Going one, this is for Bill. Touchdown! He ran the pass play, and they got behind us, and they scored. It was just a classic. Obviously, a great game for a team that didn't have a lot of success that year to be able to knock off McKinley, who was undefeated. McKinley rebounded with a victory over Maslin in 1975. 1976 started a string of four consecutive Tiger victories over the Bulldogs. In 1977, McKinley was again 9-0 going into the Maslin game. There were blizzard-like conditions that day. 
You couldn't see the ball from the stands. Brett Offenbecker had a great game that day. I think he threw two touchdown passes and then ran for another one. After the Madison game in 77, some of the players were so upset, they said, forget the playoffs. This season's already a failure. McKinley not only made the playoffs for the first time since their inception in 1972, they advanced all the way to the championship game. That was the first time that either McKinley or Madison reached the state finals. McKinley faced emerging powerhouse Cincinnati Moeller and lost 14 to two on another snowy day. John Brideweiser looks like a head coach straight out of central casting. Growing up in a single parent home, didn't really even think about going to college until my senior year. And so Brideweiser steered me towards several different schools. Purdue was one. And later, after uh, choosing Purdue, then he revealed to me that he was quarterback at Purdue University. He'd be hard pressed to find any coach that cared more about his kids than John Brideweiser. When I first went there in 1970, we put the kids in the gym, you know, he's doing calisthenics and warming up. My God, they yelled so much, you know, the hair, I'm like. And your arms did just come out. Good kids, good kids. He had some great sayings. He would always say, it's going to be a Donnybrook. These are two steel towns, so it's not always pretty. There's yelling, there's screaming, there's cursing, there's taunting. And fights. <laughs> That's the McKinley Maslin fans. That's how passionate they are about that game. You start thinking about a high school football game, you get 25,000 people. Those people, most of them were, man, they're insane. Next to our home locker room was all McKinley fans. And the kind of things they were saying and doing wouldn't typically happen in a high school game. Masson fans wanted to share their unwelcome with us, both by voice and by gesture. In the 1934 game, there's some funny business going on at the bottom of the pile. Maslin's Heine Cryer was injured, and the Maslin fans were pointing the fingers at Red Haas. He was alleged to have been at the bottom of the pile up at the end of the second quarter when Cryer got a broken ankle. And then again, there was some mischief going on in the fourth quarter. And, and Red Haas was alleged to have been in that fracas too. Haas was thrown out of the game. He was escorted to the city limits by the police and told never to set foot in Maslin again. Maslin had this flag and he only got it out McKinley week. It listed a bunch of the state championships that Maslin had won over recent history. After the 42 game, suddenly it turned out missing. They were looking around and everybody just said, it's gone. We'll never see it again. They gave up on it. Where it was, nobody knew. Well, I believe it was 1987. An attorney from Youngstown, of all places, contacts the Madison police chief and says, hey, we got this flag for you. As long as you agree that there will be no charges filed, no questions asked, he says, I'll see to it that you get it back. We have the flag today, and we got it down in our football museum. We had a guy that would deliver orange juice. And I remember that week, he said to me, Coach, I'm betting a $1,000 on the game. I said, are you out of your tree? Where in the world he got $1,000? He must have sold a lot of orange juice. There's not another high school football game played that there's betting lines on in Las Vegas. I was in Vegas, and the Maslin McKinley game was going on. And I walked over to a betting place, and I looked, and I saw Maslin McKinley there. And I go, they do. That tells you how important that game is right there. I go on out to the practice field, and there's two guys on it, and they both have binoculars. Coach Dillon had binoculars looking at Mercy Hospital to see if there was anybody on the roof. When it came to McKinley week, and you wasn't on first string, had to patrol the outside of the stadium to make sure nobody is watching our practices. Leo Strang attempted to fire up his team by planting spies in the trees. We forgot to tell the fans that were watching the practice, and they chased these fake spies out of town and drove them into a ditch before they realized that the whole thing was a put on. They didn't always have to fake it. A McKinley coach was actually in a tree spying on Maslin when the branch he was standing on broke. Maslin fans literally chased him out of town. 
They had to send an electronic specialist in the locker room to see if it was bugged. That's a serious, serious high school game. The coach who contributed to my experience at Maslin the most and my career in general would have to be Mike Kearns. Mike Kearns was ahead of his time. Very smart football coach. Mike was well before his time in coaching philosophy, psychological philosophy of handling his team. Maslin had that little Nautilus room, which was the first. The two platooning concept. The run and shoot. I don't know how many teams were running that spread offense. He was the right guy at the right time for Maslin back then. I know how high pressured that job can be. Expected to win every game. He handled it like a college program but in a high school way. He was just a, a great all-around man and probably even better person than he was a football coach. Coach Kearns was responsible for most of the spoiler victories in the late 1970s. Maslin was ruining McKinley season so often that the fans were starting to refer to it as the jinx. What is this thing these guys got over us? In the 1980 game, Terry Forbes' first year, we scored, we had 14 to seven, and then we got a safety just to really prop up the end of the deal. But we clearly were the better team. So the next week, lo and behold, they're playing in a playoff game. Masson got some breaks in this game, there's no doubt. It just seemed like every series went four downs and finally Masson held them and took the ball over and ran out the clock and ended up winning. So even when McKinley thought they had finally broken the curse, Masson came back and bit them. The Tigers made it to the championship game only to lose to perennial champion Cincinnati Moeller. Rick Spielman really gutted it out that day. Coach says, well, what's wrong? He says, well, I broke my thumbs. Sure enough, he broke both thumbs and continued to play the game. The season ended on a disappointing note, even though Maslin had knocked their arch rival out of the playoffs. Back in the late 1890s, early 1900s, they played twice, several times. This was more due to the fact that there was a smaller travel radius, and there just weren't that many teams playing football. Between 1910 and 1962, they did not play two games in one season. But that all changed in 1963 for very different reasons. McKinley was suspended in 62. Supposedly there was a kid that came from Southern Ohio that transferred to McKinley. We played intramural football. As far as the Stark County attendance that year, Masson was first. McKinley was second. There was almost 6,000 people in the stands. And back then, if you went around to high school football games, there weren't that many people even for their big games. McKinley did use some gimmicks to attract fans. They had a water balloon toss in lieu of the coin toss. They had a greased pig chase. They had speedy running back Jim Patterson race a quarter horse. He beat the horse off the line, but the horse won. In 63, Master and McKinley played twice. In the first game, it was a night game. It was the first night game ever ever played for with McKinley Maslin. They won at 24-20. We fumbled at the one foot line. And then of course they played in week 10. Maslin won it, I'd say, relatively handily, 22 to six. The only thing better than beating McKinley is beating them twice. Terry Forbes took over for John Bridewieser. In 1981, Forbes had a chance to reverse the curse. McKinley was yet again undefeated going into the Maslin game. We were definitely an underdog going into that game, and we knew we had to play our best football in order to have a chance. Maslin had been a good team all year and played an outstanding game. It was a good game. It was a typical knockout, drag him out affair. It was a defensive battle and another neighborhood slugfest. Maslin scored first on just a superb athletic play by Rick Spielman. It was a broken play. It's flushed out of the pocket, rolls out. We kind of corral him. He cuts back. A couple good masculine blocks. He's down and scores. I don't remember much about my touchdown run, but I just remember getting shoved uh, after I scored. He scores. Nick Parker comes in and plasters him into the rocks. Just last week, I got the last pebble out. <laughs> McKinley makes it 6-3 with a record-setting field goal by Nick Zeitz. The next score in that game is known as the catch among McKinley fans. We wound up hitting the play to uh, Nick Faulkner. More still to Nick Faulkner, who put a move on after he caught the ball and just plain out ran him. Two Maslin defenders, the cornerback and the safety, run into each other, and Faulkner catches the ball, takes it on in for a touchdown. We should have scored a lot more than six points, but it just seemed like every time we get to a point where 
We're supposed to do something right and shoot ourselves in the foot. So it was a very frustrating game to watch. With about two minutes left in the game, Maslin's down nine to six. They get the ball and are driving right down the field. All the McKinley fans are thinking, here we go again. Renard Torrance comes up and grabs him on the sideline. He said, man, go get the ball. Go get the ball. Stan Jackson is a tremendous, tremendous athlete. Stan Jackson late in the game cracked one of the uh, Maslin backs and he hit him. The ball flew and we recovered it. And they end up winning nine to six. That might have been one of the most physical games I've ever played in. We won the game, set the stage for the Molar game. McKinley again went all the way to the finals and again faced a heavily favored Cincinnati Molar team. Our job is not complete. We, we, we own a mission. When McKinley dominated, Darwin Rivers had one tremendous interception and ran it back to the three or four yard line. Sidney Lewis took it to the end zone. It was the first time either McKinley or Massa had won a state title under the current format of the playoffs. The following year, after defeating McKinley 7-0, just like in 1980, Maslin faced Moeller in the championship game with similar results. There was just too much talent on the other team, so they just, Moeller ended up winning. Everybody wanted Sonny to tape our ankles because he told jokes. And he brings in his son, who happened to be Chris Spielman, who was one year old, and he was in a diaper, nothing else but a diaper. And he set Chris Spielman up on the taping table next to me, right here, so I'm kind of holding Chris Spielman while his dad is taping my ankles. My cousin Wayne Fonts was coaching Detroit Lions. Chris Spielman was a linebacker. I know you went to Maslin, but I just wanted to be Chris Spielman. He played the game better than any other player that I coached against. We were always very competitive against each other. When uh, he was coming out of Ohio State, all these coaches would come and work him out. I was in grad school at Ohio State, and I would piggyback workouts. They had us do a broad jump, and we had to jump three times in a row to cover 10 yards. So Chris had went first, so I went, and I was like three, and I was like seven, so I said I got him beat again for the third event in a row. And in the middle of my third jump, I see out of the corner of my eye, my brother, and he comes and clotheslines me in midair. <laughs> I said, don't worry, it's brotherly love. We're very competitive. I love him as a Buckeye, but I hate him as a Tiger. He is the only high school football player ever to be on the Wheaties box. I wanted to be the next guy. I was just like, hey, I want to be like Chris Pillman get on the Wheaties box. You'd have to buy a box of Wheaties and there was a ballot on the Wheaties and people would fill the ballot in and send it out. When the winners were announced, I wasn't surprised, not by anything that I ever did or would accomplish on the football field, but by knowing that, hey, this is a chance for Maslin to be recognized for what it is, a unique, special place. There are so many people that give so much of themselves to these programs. 62, Mike Cooper. Mike Cooper played for McKinley in the early 80s. He had a pretty rough upbringing, but he's a self-made man. And today, he really loves to give back to the kids. In 1934, when they won the state championship, they were wearing white on red. I got you some new pants. <laughs> From Harry Stoldrayer to Sean Crable, you can always find Masson players returning to support the Tigers. Mike Doss and Kenny Peterson both returned to Canton during bye weeks. Peterson implored a two and seven Bulldog team to beat Masson, which they did by a score of 40 to eight. Sometimes the return on investment with these players come full circle. To see all the great players that played come back to Masson, I remember, uh, Tommy Hannon. I would come back and I would ask the coach, Coach, can you get Rick out of class? I would work out with him and he'd have me throw the ball to him. Then he kind of took me under his wing and we used to run and get in shape together. If you do this, this, and this, you have a great opportunity to get here, here, and here. When I got the job up in Minnesota, it's my 11th year now, people that have been there for a long time knew that I was from Maslin and asked me if I, if I knew Tommy. I think we try to give something back to the kids and get the kids geeked up about football and because that's what Mass is all about, football. There's countless individuals who give so much to both these teams, yet they've never played it down for either one of them. To me, he was dad, but for everybody else, he was Charlie. 
Charlie was, he was the ultimate fan at Camp McKinley. He's McKinley football. He loved the Bulldogs. Dad lived, breathed, bled red and black. He started the McKinley Football Hall of Fame. He took the stats. He was a historian for 40 years. He did the press books every year. Our basement was red, black, full of material. That is a, a museum. He wrote a book called 103 Days in November, which chronicled the first 103 games of this famous rivalry. He was so passionate uh, uh, about uh, the McKinley football program. He passed away in 2006, and we had to find a nursing home for him to go to. And one was in Maslin, and the other one was Old McKinley High School. He wanted to go to McKinley High School to pass away. He had three final wishes. One was he wanted a bulldog on his headstone. He um, wanted to have a red and black casket, and he wanted a final drive by the school the stadium and the Hall of Fame on his way to the uh, cemetery. And we, of course, fulfilled all three. Special guy to, to, to McKinley. Very special man, I, I love him. Judy Studer was an icon in Maslin. Went to the lumber yard, went on Thorn Street, made a sign, said Judy Studer signs, and put it in the front yard, and started in the garage with three kids. And that led them to getting involved with the football program. They started doing the silk screening and the shirts and then they opened what they called the Tiger Store. I remember going with him up to the stadium. Me and Steve would go along and we'd go up and paint the hoop. He had an uncanny feel for the community and what they needed and that was always reflected in his hoops. That's the definition of Maslin football as the Studer family. And of course he has two sons, Joe and Steve. Both great centers. Coach Stu. I remember seeing Steve for the first time and just my jaw dropped. Stu was no taller than me, but you thought he was a giant. He was big. It all started in his garage, you know, with uh, Jared Vance and Chris Spielman. Knocked on the door and introduced myself, Mr. Studer. I'm Chris Spielman, can, can I work out with you? He said, sure. And so I started just walking to his garage twice a week. It was Tuesdays and Saturday nights. And then all of a sudden, all these guys started getting full rides to Penn State, the highest state, and Indiana. And somebody wised up and said he ought to be training everybody. And they brought him in to be a strength coach. He was just loving it and being part of the team. And I think more importantly, impacting and affecting young people's lives. Probably the greatest individual I've ever, ever been around. Steve was a great mentor to me and my brother. He was a major influence on me. He was a special person. He, he really cared about us as, as kids. He just loved you. As genuine as they get, a great dad and a great husband, and we, we lost him way too early. His funeral, I seen people who have never thrown a football, never lifted a weight, come there because Stu touched him somehow. It's a beautiful thing to have that impact on people, you know? Excuse me, yeah. Stu's a good dude. In his honor and honor Joe's honor and all the other Studers, there's only one number that's been retired at Maslin, and that's 55. Snow was a man playing with boys. He was also the most valuable player in the Rose Bowl in Michigan State. Percy was the first player to win the Butkus and Lombardi Awards in the same year. And then later on, we went on to play with the Chiefs and where he was real all rookie team. Percy is also a member of the College Football Hall of Fame. Tom McDaniel's era, I mean, it lasted so long. And growing up as a kid in Canton, you knew you were going to play for Tom. For Ken McKinley to have you know, Tom McDaniels, he was a staple in our community. I mean, he was such a great teacher and such like a father figure. He just put your arm around you when you needed it. He would discipline you when you needed it. And he did it with such grace and just, just was always a, a man of, of integrity and honor. You understood that. Uh, the respect and the tenacity leading up to that Master McKinley week was all built on his personality as well. He was such a, a great influence on so many people. Tom 
gets letters from kids all the time. When he left after he won the national championship, and like I started crying, and my grandpa was like, you know, what's wrong? And I'm like, you know, Coach McD is leaving. It was a great upbringing to be able to uh, kind of shadow him. It was really special to, to grow up that way as a little boy and see uh, how he approached his job, none of which ever felt like a job. He always included us in practice games, bus trips to away games. I think he let me be a ball boy, you know, when I was little, little. And to watch him invest so much of his life into the game, um, it became very easy for me to see myself doing it someday, too. Earl Bruce and Don Nealon, you know, when I was growing up, my father was never in that list. He's got more wins than everybody does, you know, and to win as many times as he did against Maslin is something we're proud of, obviously. Tom also has the distinction of having a four-game winning streak and backing up later on with another four-game winning streak. He's the only McKinley coach to ever beat him four in a row. He's a good dad, he's a good husband, and I wasn't sure how good of a coach he was until I was around him a long, long time. And then I found out he was a really good coach. McKinley and Maslin kids, uh, they're waiting for their moment, and when their moment comes, most of the time they do very well. Travis McGuire came over and ran for 300 yards in our stadium. Travis was talented. In the game, holes as wide as this room, and Travis didn't need a hole that big. I mean, you give him that much room to gain 301 yards in a game, you, you gotta be pretty good. He just had a field day that day. In that game, they play at ability levels that you know you wouldn't normally play. They're supermen, and Travis had one of those games, and to keep getting stronger and stronger as the game went on was incredible. Here we are in 1994, and they're playing the 100th game. Amazing. The 100th game deservedly had a lot of value. The lead up and the build up was enormous. People from all over the country were calling for tickets to that game. We all knew going into it uh, that it was the 100th game and there was going to be a lot of coverage from ESPN. Sports Illustrated cameras, you know, kind of in the huddle at practice. To have, you know, Sports Illustrated walking through your high school. And I don't know how many newspapers throughout the state wanted to be at that game. This is not just another football game, obviously. I can remember hair going up the back of my neck just walking out there. We've got a coin that was used at the coin flip to commemorate that event. Bart Starr was going to flip the coin. I just happened to be talking to Bart. I would really be honored if you'd be interested in coming. He said, I'll plan on it. That's the most people that I've ever seen at a coin toss in my life. I didn't know the scale of the game because, again, I'm a kid. I'm 17 years old. I didn't know it was bragging rights, though, for either the next 100 years or the next 100 games. Glad you could join us for this moment of high school football history. We had Willie Spencer Jr., who was just a terrific option quarterback. Willie's ability to improvise and take nothing and turning it into something, I mean, he was, he was known for that. And then on the other side, you had Josh McDaniels, who was the prototypical quarterback, you know, drop back, play action pass, through the nice ball, and they had guys that could catch it. So both quarterbacks really started to play well. It was back and forth. Back and forth. It was a fast game. That turf at Maslin was really a fast surface. The back and forth scoring was just a combination of, um, of coaching, play calling, and, uh, and, and execution. In McKinley 14, and Maslin and Washington 14. We came out at halftime, and I told the team, if, if we get into a second and short, we're going to run the flea flicker. We put that in on Friday morning. Which I think we only practiced once. If you ask Jack Rose, he'll tell you that. We practiced that play one time. Ashcraft tosses back to Spencer. A guy came clean, and due to Victor's speed, able to get down the field, I just launched it. Sure enough, uh, we hit it. Victor was there and, and uh, was able to make the catch and score. And he'll score for the Massel Tigers. Right at the end of the game, I think McKinley scored and tied the game up. It's 35-35. We go into the overtime. And Willie Spencer looks at me and goes, you know, I'm really nervous. For a 17-year-old kid um, to have a whole city on his back, basically. <laughs> I go, what do you want to do? He goes, I want to get in the power set. Him just hearing power set, I think calmed him down. There was no way Willie wasn't getting the ball. <laughs>
We scored. Kenton Mitchell had his fourth touchdown. His fourth touchdown of the afternoon. Josh McDaniels, he was their leader. He was their place kicker. Well, here comes the point after that means it all right now. And it's off to the right. Josh uh, missed his kick. Josh has been a reliable kicker all year for us and just not exactly sure you know, how it went out to the right. I was shocked more than anything because, you know, Josh was a great kicker. It was heartbreaking for him. If there's anybody that can handle something like that, it was Josh. Strong-minded, you know, just mentally tough kind of guy. It was a great opportunity for me to learn from that uh, experience. There was, you know, adversity, obviously, at a young age. We got the ball then. And there's an opening for the Tigers. I've always wanted that moment. The momentum and the pressure just kept building and building. Willie pitched the ball. I thought Willie was going to take it in, but at the last second, he, he pitched it. Victor Reddick took it in for a touchdown. And it can be argued that it was a forward lateral. We're side by side. And then, of course, his momentum carried him through. It may have looked like it was a forward lateral, but it wasn't a forward lateral. The pitch, you know, will always be uh, talked about. I didn't have a good angle at it, so I can't comment on it. But I think that was always something that, you know, people will talk about. And it just adds to the lore of the 100th game. I was on the other side of the field. It looked, it looked like a great pitch to me. <laughs> Nick Grivich to win the ball game. When things go silent and you just feel yourself in the moment, When I was running out into the field, uh, Willie Spencer came over and got in my face and was like, Nick, you better make this kick. We're all hoping, you know, for failure for a boy from Maslin. I just went out there and it was a good snap, good hold, and I uh, made the kick. I remember just running toward my team that was rushing the field and just kind of like a mob. And I mean, it was just euphoria. So you have pure elation on one side and absolute despondence on the other. No one felt worse than Josh. He was heartbroken, and uh, I just know that I, I hung on to him. I recall not shaking Jack Rose's hand. I felt like I needed to be somewhere else you know, for these few minutes, uh, and meeting the head coach at the center field didn't include that. And, and there's something wrong about that, but I think that there's something right about that, too. The only Maslin game I think that I cried, because I knew how hard it was for him. And that was the end of it. the best game I was ever played. What a game. I mean, what a game. The game itself lived up to the buildup. For that to be the 100th game, I mean, it's just, it's just amazing. I think that was a tremendous high school football game that I don't know that anybody that was a part of it wouldn't be proud of. And the lead up was great. The game was even better. Um, and the best part about it for us is we got to do it again two weeks later. Just two weeks after arguably the greatest game in the history of high school football, these two teams met again in the playoffs. It's really tough when you play a quality program twice to beat them twice. And McKinley went up there with the idea of rubber bowl revenge. It was a great setting. It was a perfect night, and it was packed. This is a big stadium. Um, there's a lot of people here. Very seldom were you able to get in to a mckinley Maslin game. It's at the rubber bowl, so we have a huge stadium. People were still filing in at the kickoff. I wouldn't have ever dreamed of being able to play in front of that many people. You try to explain to people, I think there was 35,000 people at my second to last game in, in high school, and people were like, what are you talking about? We had arrived at the stadium uh, ahead of Maslin. It's a 7 o'clock kickoff. Uh, we're scheduled to leave at 4. We took the field, and uh, there's no other team warming up at the other end. We're on the bridge. I look up and I say, boy, there's a lot of traffic there. Well, that traffic was backed up. We weren't moving. Claire Mascara, who was the head of the OHSAA at the time, he came up to me and he said, Tom, we have a problem. Uh, Maslin is, uh, is caught in traffic. And I remember responding to him, you know, politely but firmly that this, that was not my fault. They're telling you the game starts at 7. It took us two hours to go from that bridge to the stadium. And we get there, and uh, the referees wanted none of it. They didn't feel sorry for us at all. We only had about 20 minutes to get ready to warm up. That game was also a back and forth affair. Touchdown, McKinley. Spencer will run it. It was a tremendous ball game. It went right down to the wire. Spencer will score. Josh threw a skinny post to Mark Fuse. He couldn't have thrown it any better. Josh made a great 
throw right into a little bit of a window right there. I remember making one move on a guy um, and then kind of making it barely into the end zone. Just a magical five, six, seven seconds of my life. And to make sure they got ahead by seven, Juice Lancaster went to the right as though he was going to run the ball, threw it back to Josh McDaniels, who got the two-point conversion. It was a neat deal to be able to come back and play him and kind of um, you know, get out of the shadow of what happened at the end of the 100th game. You know, that's what makes the rivalry great. They, they bounced back and came back and beat us. It was a magical night. It was awesome. To play in, in front of 30-some thousand people uh, at 17 years old in high school, I mean, it was great. It really was. Before the start of the 97 season, I knew McKinley was going to be rated in the top five. So I went and grabbed a USA Today, and, I, and somebody must have thought I was crazy. I started cheering as I picked the paper up as I saw the headline of the sporting section. One of the first things I did after getting that call from USA Today is I made a call to Chuck Kyle. He says, tell him it's an honor now that can become an achievement. NASA, you, you can wave all the headlines you want at them. They, they come prepared. We went at them. They just had more. They had some guys who could go. Kenny Peterson, Doss. DeMarlo Rozier had a phenomenal game. We won by less than two touchdowns, and Masson was in it until midway in the fourth quarter. We're 10-0, we're undefeated, we're going into the playoffs, and I went into a quiet locker room. There was no celebration. We went 10-0, it was like we lost the game. They were furious with themselves because we had won, but they hadn't played better. We won and didn't feel good about how we won. If we can beat Masson and they're not happy with the way they played, oh boy, we've got something good here. For the fourth time in the playoff era, McKinley met Moeller in the championship game. We played um, Cincinnati Moeller essentially for the national title because we were still rated number one. Moeller had a big tackle. It was a sophomore named Munoz, Anthony Munoz's son. Kenny Peterson handled him. We win it, and the state and national championship are ours. Terry Hodakovic, not too many people thought he was going to do that much because so many of the players had graduated. It was his first experience um, in the rivalry. It was back and forth. We jumped ahead a little bit. Game's running down in the fourth quarter. Everybody's getting excited. We're going to win this game. I said, this isn't over yet. And they hit a long pass right down the sideline. We expected to go into that game, play well, and we expected to have a chance to win. We had to win to make the playoffs. And I just said, I just want the ball. I said, just whatever it takes, just give me the ball. We're going to win this game. Mike Doss scored four touchdowns. We're in midfield late in the game. We run a counter with Mike Doss, and he breaks his 50, 60 yards for a touchdown. And then we block a punt and score in their end zone, and the game's over. I remember going back to the bus, and a guy runs out in front of the bus and stops the bus and looks at me and says, well, coach, you're one of us now. They went on to play St. Xavier in the state title game. The remarkable thing about that season was we won two state titles in a row. It was the only time a public school has ever won two titles in a row under the playoff system. Coach Cross, he brought back the tradition of tough, hard-nosed McKinley football. After going two and three to start the 2004 season, McKinley righted the ship and defeated Maslin, catapulting them into the playoffs. We went on to play in the state championship game. We had to play an incredible team, one of the best teams that ever played in Ohio, called Coleraine, and they were good that year. Ryan Brinson had a long touchdown run. In 2005, Maslin McKinley game, both teams are undefeated. Well, that was the first time since 64 both teams came in 9-0. and If you was around that week, you thought it was Super Bowl. I got so much uh, adrenaline running, I'm crying. Morgan Williams was running like a man possessed that game. Everything went our way. McKinley totally dominated. I think it was 38-8. to Both teams make the playoffs. Both teams win weeks 11 and 12. By the time we got to the McKinley game, you know, we were playing pretty good football. Coach Stacy did an outstanding job. And our kids played their heart out. I mean, it was a game where you just got to give them a lot of credit. Of course, that team went on and played in the state championship game. 
There were a number of those years in which I played two games in one season. It's usually the same story. I don't know what it is. And it's just the irony of having to play a team twice in one season. In 2015, McKinley and Maslin played the last game in Fawcett Stadium. Only the North stands were completed for the inaugural 1938 game. Those stands had already been demolished, leaving only the South stands for the final game. They went back and forth. We were trying to hold on to a lead. They score on a pass play that was intercepted late in the game. Dominique Robinson was unflappable. He let him down the field and took the ball in himself. He flipped into the end zone. End zone, touchdown! Just made it by about a yard. I would never just try to do a front flip on purpose. He hit my leg and his impact on the bottom of my foot, it just flipped me. It was typical of McKinley Masson that would come down to the last play because so many of them have. This rivalry forced those two programs to move years ahead, light years in some aspects, ahead of the normal football pace. There were a lot of coaches who were watching Maslin and McKinley's offense and defense in Oklahoma and Louisiana and all those other places, and they were emulating that because it was excellent. It's spread from there, and it's gone to some other places that have really good high school football. Both programs are moving away or pulling along the game with it. What McKinley has accomplished and what Maslin has accomplished is that at every level, you see our mark. Whether it be playing, coaching, front office, you can almost tie somebody back to Stark County. You have countless players and coaches that have gone on to major college football. Ten of those men are in the College Football Hall of Fame. There are so many players from each team, McKinley, Maslin, that went on to play pro football. Between these two schools, 50 players have been drafted into the NFL. Collectively, there are 13 Super Bowl rings between Maslin and McKinley players. Five players from these two schools have gone on to become head coaches in the NFL. You've got Paul Brown and Mary Motley in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. It seems like Maslin and McKinley is tied into everything. Those early Browns teams were littered with Maslin and McKinley players. In Denver, you had numerous Bulldogs working for the franchise at the same time. For us all to kind of be together in the, in the NFL, um, was really cool. The people that were in Denver, uh, some of my friends here in New England, it's the same thing. We, we talk about it often. We know when the McKinley Masson game is. In 2015, the NFL presented gold footballs to high schools that have produced players that have participated in Super Bowls. A school percentage of high school players make it to the professional ranks, but Maslin and Cannon were producing neighborhoods full of them. Tommy Hannon with the Minnesota Vikings, Dennis Franklin with the Detroit Lions, Willie Spencer with the New York Giants, and I'm with the Green Bay Packers. We all live within a half mile of each other. Willie Spencer lived right next door to us. We all grew up within, you know, a, a six block radius. Tyler Everett grew up three streets over from me. I played with Tyler in high school and in college, and then we eventually played against each other in the pros. We had Reggie Corner, he grew up in the same neighborhood. That neighborhood has been producing NFL talent for decades. Great players certainly helped define this rivalry, but it's the families that play generation after generation that really form its foundation. My brother Willard's wife's father was Glenn Goss, and Glenn Goss is one of the all-time great McKinley ball players. My brother Wiz, he was the best defensive back I've ever seen, and he had his sons that played. Then I had my three sons, they played for Maslin. You have the mingling of the Grimsleys and the Gosses, and you came up with some pretty doggone good ball players through there. The Grimsleys are not the only ones to cross pollinate. Ryan Brinson, star running back from McKinley, is the grandson of two star running backs from Maslin, Art Hastings and Ivory Benjamin. McKinley's Tut Allen, who played on the 1934 championship team, had a son, Jerry, who played for Maslin and then went on to play for the Washington Redskins. The Houston brothers are legendary in Maslin. My dad was a farmer. 
he had a lot of food to eat, but uh, he wasn't making any money. So he decided that he would go look for a job. And uh, he ran out of gas and money in Madison, Ohio. Got a job at Republic Steel. Four of us went through college playing football, and three of us ended up playing professional football. Lynn was the oldest, and he was our leader. Lynn played eight years with the Cleveland Browns. Lyndall Houston was a favorite of my dad's. He played for my dad at Maslin, at Ohio State, and with the Browns. Jim was a very good football player, too. He played 13 years with the Browns. The Lewis brothers played for McKinley over a span of three decades, and they all earned scholarships to college. Five Whitfield brothers were the first of three generations to play football for Maslin. To be at Whitfield, the bar is set high internally. Up until me, every Whitfield had either been a state champion, a captain, or all Ohio. And in some cases, some were all three. The Parks family, like the Whitfields, also has that championship pedigree. Ernie and Bob both played on championship teams in the early 1940s. Sam's son, Vic, played on the 1981 championship team. And the next generation of Bulldogs and Tigers will soon be taking the field. I think that all of the people that have been involved in this game throughout the years just really solidifies the fact that this is the ultimate game. There's a great deal of pride that a player has having played in this rivalry. It was such a privilege. It was just a real honor to play in that game, man. How many times during our lives do we have a chance to be a part of something great? We were given something by people who preceded us. You're not playing for yourself. You're playing for everybody who played for this program before you were here. Mass McKinley rivalry has just been a cornerstone of, of, of football in general. The time just has always stood still in Maslin with what was important in that community. It's the well-being of the football program. And I always felt that I was a caretaker for that. We're caretakers of something here and we got to do it the right way. We can only hope to add to the, to the, the significance of it. I'm glad I was a part of it. I'm glad I was able to play in it. I played in the Mass McKinley game, and that's special to me. At the Hall of Fame, uh, you know, we celebrate excellence everywhere, and this rivalry really epitomizes that sentiment. It was a cool place to grow up, and for a football fanatic like myself, I was lucky to be able to be a part of that community. For our communities to be part of really what I've called the most relevant high school sporting event in our country, that's really special. I'm glad Dad ran out of gas and money in this. <laughs> you got to beat race barriers, you got to beat poverty, you got to beat a lot of things if you wore orange and black. Where champions are made and success is tradition, I really truly believe in that saying and it's been that way throughout McKinley history. Both Canton and Maston embrace football being important, and they're not ashamed of that. It's a uh, strong rivalry. Both sides take it seriously, and they both uh, want to win. And I would tell you that this is a good thing. When it comes to just blood and guts of football, the Maston mckinley rivalry is all day, hands down, is the best. This is so pure. What football means to the area, it's really the founding of, of the game. When you put all these other quote-unquote rivalry games through the acid test, none are going to stand with this one. None. This is really the home of football, and this is the greatest rivalry there is. Yeah.